Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Bass. I'm a content marketing manager over at RevenueWell, and thank you so much for uh, attending today's webinar. Um, this might be the biggest one we've ever done. Um, so before I get into my introduction, I will say we have a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, lay them out there throughout the entire course of this webinar, and we will uh, moderate it at the end. So please, we're looking for some great questions. Um, today's presenter is really a man who needs no introduction, um, but I'm gonna try anyways. Uh, it's Fred Joyle, founder of 1-800-DENTIST, uh, best-selling author several times over, pretty much the foremost authority in dental marketing, and uh, pretty cool, I think, um, Fred, you're doing something with us at ADOM here next month. Um, so, you know, we're all excited about that. And I'm just going to kind of get out of your way and let you take the reins and run with this thing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and yeah, ADOM is going to be pretty exciting. If people don't know what ADOM is, it's, uh, it's the Association of Dental Office Managers. Uh, and their annual meeting is coming up in Orlando in July. Uh, and it's just a, it's the best meeting ever for, for uh, peer camaraderie and, and learning for office managers. And, and Alex and I uh, look forward to getting there every year because it's such a, a, a great crowd and it's, and there's so much learning going on and, and, uh, and, and uh, catching up that people do. It's, and they treat us really well as speakers. So, and we're going to do some, we, we've got a real surprise cooked up for everybody who's coming. So I hope you can make it. Uh, it's, uh, the website is dentalmanagers.com. So uh, I'd love to see you there. Uh, Alex Nudell and I are going to do some fun stuff on stage and I'm speaking there and he's speaking there separately as well. Um, but let's talk about this. Jonathan, let's let me get into um, what I like to talk about, which is the patient experience, because a lot of dentists are still spending a lot of time sharpening their clinical skills in hopes that that's going to fill their practice. And of, and of course, you need great clinical skills and you need to keep up with new technology and all of that. But the patient experience is very seldom related to the clinical aspect of the practice uh, and it's and it's because of the one the nature of human beings which is we make a lot of decisions much more emotionally uh, and we assess things much more emotionally than we do rationally much as we we love to think that we're extremely rational uh, all the time but uh, what most people are doing is they're picking up all of these subconscious cues and things like that um, and so in order to create a, a loyal, accepting patient who's going to refer the practice and also do the treatment that you recommend, you have to create a very specific type of experience. And there are some very practical things that you need to do to make that happen. And also, more and more, it's something you really have to do because dentistry is becoming more competitive. There, there, the group practices are out there accepting all insurances open a lot more hours uh, in very convenient locations. And this just makes it harder for just any dentist who who's thinks they can practice like they did 20 years ago to succeed. So what I like to do is, is give you a, a sense of how human beings think. And the example I use is this guy, Alfred Hitchcock. Now, uh, the name is probably familiar to everyone, although he's been gone a long time because he really was the master of the the scary movie the thriller not the horror movie not the gory stuff he created the real thriller concept uh and and did an amazing job with psycho and birds and south by uh, north by northwest and uh, and all of those really terrific movies um and what was interesting and relevant to what I'm going to talk about today is he had two different scripts whenever he was making a movie. The first one was the, what you would consider the, the standard screenplay, which is 
uh, the, the, the dialogue and the scenes and, and everything basically that the cameraman and the actors needed to know about what to say and the set designers and all that stuff. So, so, it, it, and this was really what he wanted those people to know and what the, he wanted the audience to know about the story as he was going along. But, and that was his blue script. He called it his blue script. He also had a thing called his green script, which is what he wanted the audiences to feel throughout the movie. And he would put it right there in the script. Now you'd say, oh, well, of course, he wants them to feel scared. And it's like, no, it's much more involved than that. He wanted to take them on a journey of feeling that he, that he was the master of. He wanted you to start to really like this character, that she was really wonderful and, and, you know, and people were taking advantage of her or whatever, and it seemed like she was downtrodden. And all of a sudden, you realize she's the villain in the story, and she's been manipulating everybody. Or... He wants you to get nervous. This person's going into the room and they're going to open that door. And it's like, no, and the audience is going, don't open the door. Don't open the door. And then the character opens the door anyway and nothing happens. And you relax. You go, oh, oh I'm so glad there was nothing bad there. And then somebody jumps up behind them uh, and, and, and the whole audience jumps. So it's a whole journey of an emotional experience and it's brilliant. And it was why he was so successful um, because he understood that it was what he, what he wanted them to feel right up to the end about the movie and about the experience that made his movie so good. He was conscious that he was taking them on an emotional journey. And that's the point I want to make is can we as dental teams be conscious of what we want our patients to feel in that visit, in that journey, in that treatment, and after that treatment for, for, throughout the relationship. Because it's not just about the visit. It's how do they feel about you in general? And how do they experience the practice and then go talk about it? So think about this. What do, you, what do you want your patients to be feeling in the visit with your team and then after? Do you want them, wouldn't it be nice if they felt attractive, if they felt beautiful? Because you're capable of making them feel better about how they look. That's a really powerful, impactful thing to somebody and a very emotionally intense experience to to change them from not feeling good about themselves to feeling attractive and you've done it you've transformed a lot of people's lives over the course of your career probably over the course of the past few months you've done it but what a great feeling to to send somebody out with and and believe me that resonates with people when they're when they leave with a positive feeling that they are more attractive because of you, that's, that's gonna translate into how they communicate about you to the rest of the world. Um, and how about respected? Wouldn't you want them to feel respected in the practice? And a lot of times they don't feel that way in the medical environment. You know, there's a, there's a, they, you know when they go into hospitals or emergency rooms or a lot of times to see a general physician or a surgeon, they get a little bit of arrogance, they get rushed along, they get treated like they're just an insurance file. And, and uh, you know, when the average person who goes to see a general physician spends four minutes with that physician, they're just passing through. There's been a nurse there, there's been somebody running through the paperwork, there's taken a bunch of notes. The doctor comes through, asks a couple of questions, looks in your mouth or something, and then there, if he, you know, maybe he looks in, in your mouth, but a lot of times they don't even do that. They, they ask a bunch of questions and then they're gone. People don't feel respected at all. And it, unfortunately, 
there's a lot of times they go into a dental practice and don't feel respected. And I think this is the downfall of some of the group practices is they don't know how to make those patients feel respected. I have a, a good friend in the, the south side of Chicago, and he has a million dollar practice in, in that neighborhood because of how well he treats people who are basically in, in the lower middle class or below. Uh, and he, you know, he sees all emergencies. He'll be open till Friday night at 10 o'clock at night taking care of people. But he always treats them with respect. And he may be the only person who treats them that way. Not their boss, not the people that they work with or the customers that they're forced to work with in, in whatever job they have. By him treating them with respect, then he's solidified something very, very effective and powerful with that person and built a practice. I mean, the million dollar practice is a heck of a good practice anywhere, but in the south side of Chicago, it's really impressive. Um, and wouldn't you want your patients to feel loved, feel that you actually are caring for them in the deepest possible way because you care about who they are and how healthy they are. If they believe that everything that you're doing for them and that you recommend for them is because you care about them as a person, which means you love them, they're going to accept treatment. Then they're going to shift away from, oh, this is about you making more money or I don't know if I can trust what you're recommending. And so these are, this is, these are things that you want to create and you can do it. And that's why the, the title about the, uh, of this course is, uh, is it's all in the detail. It's, you know, it's little things that you do. It's not these big sweeping changes that you have to make in your practice. But also, I want you to think about what you don't want them to feel as a patient, like unsafe. You certainly don't want them to ever feel that way in your practice. And there's a lot of ways that we make that happen too, that we make them feel, you know, it's a very vulnerable position to lie back in a chair with your mouth open and somebody's coming at you with instruments. Uh, the, you know, it's hard to identify with because we, you do it all day long, but for a person who does it once a year or twice a year or has treatment every two or three years, it's a very different experience and it's really uncomfortable. You don't want them to feel unsafe. You don't want them to feel unsafe about their money either, which is mistrust. You don't want them to feel like you have another motivation besides them getting better and you giving them your professional opinion of what needs to be done and how important it is to get done. And then that last word is so critical, insignificant. Nobody wants to feel insignificant. When that happens, it's over in my mind, in, in any sort of relationship, whether it's a personal relationship. I mean, there's, there's marriages that break up because one person makes the other person just feel insignificant, or they're just really unhappy in the relationship because that's what's happening. You don't want to do anything that makes that patient feel that way. And all of these things, it's also in the details, these little things that you can do that you're not conscious of that you're not paying attention to that makes somebody feel unsafe or that they can't trust you or worst of all that they feel insignificant and so i'm going to get back to this point that i said at the very beginning which is the experience of being in your practice is going to matter more than your clinical exper expertise because they can't judge your clinical expertise. They, I, I can't either. I could pull every chart in your office, and I can't tell if you're an average dentist, above average, below average, but I can tell what it feels like to walk into your practice. I can tell the energy that your team has, 
And people can pick this up, patients pick this up in a matter of seconds when they walk into a practice or they start to talk to the dentist or they interact with the team members. Everything that they see and touch and taste and hear and smell is affecting this experience in the practice. And that's, ex that's affecting case acceptance. That's ex affecting loyalty. That's affecting whether they're going to refer to you or ever even come back. Never mind accepting treatment. They may just disappear and they're not going to tell you why. They may say on Yelp why they're not coming back, but they probably aren't going to tell you if they don't come back. They're just not coming back. And so what I try to emphasize with practices is these two things that I'm going to mention are what builds practice success, certainly true of most businesses, but certainly in a dental practice, is it is the, these two pillars that your practice is built on, is your trustworthiness and the value that they have of dentistry and of the dentistry you offer. These things are both critical to a practice's success and always will be. No matter what technology is invented, if robots are doing half the dentistry 20 years from now and you're just assisting, it doesn't matter. Your the trust in you and the perception of value of dentistry is what's going to make them be loyal and accept treatment and refer you. Here's the important thing to remember. Your trustworthiness is a perception. It is not a fact. It is built on all sorts of subjective cues and past experiences by the person and things that you've said and done and, and all sorts of stuff that almost sometimes seems irrelevant. But there is no factual assessment of your trustworthiness. Nobody can, act, they're not going to be able to go in and see, you know, run a credit report on you and see if you've ever bounced a check or, or been, you know, been sued for stuff and what, and actually the suit was not your fault or whatever. They, they, they can't figure that out. They're going, we go around deciding whether to trust people or not. And we are, and sometimes we are just, we don't trust many people. And some other people trust too many people. But there are things that we have to do to create trust. Or well, they're not going to accept treatment. And as I said, they're very subtle. It's in the details. But also, it's the same problem with value. Value is a perception. What people think stuff is worth varies incredibly widely. You know, there's, you know, there's, examples everywhere. They may say, you know, I, I, I use this Apple watch as an example. Is they, they, this is a $12,000 watch that works the same as the $400 watch, except it's 24 karat gold. So to some people, having a more expensive watch is value. It's $12,000. Now, if you said, look, you, you, you need $12,000 worth of dentistry, they go, ah, that seems like a lot of money. And you're looking at their watch and you're going, no, the watch is a lot of money that you're not getting anywhere near as much value out of except subjectively, whereas the dentistry I'm going to do on you is extremely valuable. So we have to move them into this thinking about value and trust by doing these little detail things to change their perception, to enhance their perception. And it's, it's all based on human nature. There's no secrets here. It's how we react to stuff too. Um, and so this is why I emphasize so much. It's about enhancing that experience that the patient has in the office so that they look at things differently, they, they think about you in a better light. And it's, and it's not going to be the, the training that you've gotten there. Those things are assumed. They assume you went to dental school and you know what you're doing and you know how to handle a drill and you know how to handle a syringe. They don't want you using any of that stuff on them, but they assume that you have those skills. 
And it's, it's also very interesting if you think about in dentistry, how often do they ask what dental school you went to? It doesn't matter to them that much. Whereas people, they go, oh, I went to Harvard, I went to Stanford, I, you know, I went to Columbia. With their, you know, in, in other fields, even in um, medicine, that, that, that degree somehow matters more if they went to one of those colleges. People don't ask, oh, did you go to Tufts? Did you go to UOP? That, for the most part, that doesn't mean anything to people. They assume you are a well-trained dentist. That's why the experience becomes so important. And it comes down to this very simple thing. What is your likability? What is the likability of your team? Because we don't like to do business. We don't with people we don't like. So this is something you have to be conscious of. You have to think about as you're interacting with people. It is you're not in a pure treatment healthcare environment. There's a lot of things that are elective in dentistry, like all the good stuff. Because otherwise, you can just pull the tooth and make the immediate problem go away most of the time, which is obviously terrible dentistry. But you need to be conscious of the fact that because so many things are optional, you have to have this feeling of likability that gets transmitted, that's through your communication, through your actions, through your environment. And there's a, a phrase I like to use, and, and, it, and I want to use it as a, a trigger to uh, decide certain actions you want to take or decisions you want to make about how you do stuff and, and how people think about their communications and everything. It's a very simple phrase. It's called adding the frosting. It's that what's the little bit, that little touch that you can do that sweetens the situation just a little bit. That's what makes all the difference with people in, in, in all sorts of aspects in life. That's why I, call, I say add, add, adding the frosting. I say, you know, a muffin is just a muffin, but, you know, a cupcake, that's fun. And that's, that's kind of what you're trying to do. That's part of the likability and the 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 playfulness even and the friendliness and all of that stuff that's what the frosting is about you know and this is what flips people neurologically even in the direction that we want them to be in we want them to respond a certain way to certain things just like we do and so we have to use what i call uh details of delight little moments where you can transmit that feeling by something that you're doing, something that you're getting across to the, to the person by this littlest of action. Now you, this example here is I walked into a hotel room. Now, it wasn't a particularly exciting hotel room. It was like Hampton Inn or something like that. But the maid had done little Mr. Towel Man for me and stuck it on the bed. And she herself, I talked to her, she bought these little glasses to put on the towel. And I just thought, what a delightful thing. I mean, how could I not tip this maid? And how could she, she has taken a mundane experience walking into an average hotel room in a town I don't know that well. And I walk in and I get this little detail of delight. And it, it impacts you. And so you, you, want to be thinking about that in your whole environment. I'll give you another hilarious sort of example is this. This is a restroom in a nightclub in Las Vegas. And they decided, hey, this is a boring restroom. You, you know, let's make it fun. Let's make the men's room interesting. So they created this hilarious setup at the urinal. Uh, the only problem is it's very hard to get started going in there, but uh, that's, you know, that's the way men are. You know? that's, that's, that's our challenge. But just a, a delightful little thing to do so that people are just going, hey, that, this is a fun place. And so this is part of creating that experience is so much about the environment you create in the practice. Because we're responding to all sorts of things when we walk into an office 
or a store or anything like that. We're responding to colors and lighting and textures and smells and sounds. That's why there's music playing almost everywhere you go now. But people will walk in, and I've heard them say it, they'll walk into a dental practice like this, and they'll say, wow, I had no idea dentistry could be like this. They'll say those words, and which is interesting because they've experienced no dentistry, and their opinion about the dentistry has been changed by the furniture and the flooring and the wall colors and the lighting because we're human beings. Starbucks remodels their stores every three years, going around and around the country, remodeling them. Why? Do they like to spend money on, con on contractors and things like that? No. It's they want their current customers to feel like they're in a new coffee shop. They're still in a Starbucks, but it's a new one. And it feels good to the regulars. And this is, I've heard this over and over again from from practice consultants like like people at Fortune Management, they'll say uh, when a practice remodels their reception area, just the reception area, modernizes it, makes it look warm and inviting. The current patients start to spend more money, start to accept more treatment, and it ends up paying for the remodel in a matter of a few months. That's bizarre, except it's human nature. So. Don't fight it. <laughs> Accept human nature for what it is and uh, understand that, it, that it, it's how people behave and how people respond and take advantage of it. It's make the investment to transform that experience from the second they walk in the office. And also anything, any little thing you can do to make them comfortable, whether it's warm hand towels or pashminas to, for people who are chilly in the chair, or, you know, there's some practices using service dogs. Uh, and it's pretty simple. You got to like dogs yourself, and it's going to be the right kind of dog. But patients routinely love it, that it relaxes them. And don't you want your patients to be relaxed? Don't you want them to do uh, uh, the treatment that you offer because they're relaxed and not anxious as you're presenting to them or even as you're treating them? Treatment's going to go faster, in fact. Uh, and, and so what we're trying to do here is make them understand that we're thinking about them and that we know that they're anxious here. And you can always say, you have a little sign to say, we have a service dog. If that bothers you in any way, we'll lock the dog up during your visit. The dog won't be around. But more people are going to say, where's the dog? I have a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. John Merrill out in, in, in uh, North Carolina, and he has his dog, his service dog in the practice, has his own Instagram page. And people are commenting and writing about it all, all the time. This dog, Steve, that he has, is, is always in the office. And he's looking, you can see him in the second picture. There's John working with, on the patient, and the dog is, is, you know, pretty much evaluating his technique at this point. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and this, this works for people. This is doing something unique. And this is the other important part about details of delight, is what's memorable to people is something different. That's what we remember is we, when something unexpected happens, that's what sticks in our mind. And so this is what you're going to be trying to do, those little details of delight that are simple but also unexpected, unexpectedly positive. And, of course, it, it, certainly technology is going to affect their perception of value because when they see modern technology, they feel like they're getting the latest in healthcare. But you have to communicate that. You have to say, we have this set of technology because it eliminates the second visit and, and we don't have to do shots and drilling in, 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 uh, in another visit and put a temporary on you and all of that. And we can match your teeth in one visit with uh, uh, beautiful, uh, natural looking 
enforcement. It's all about what, what it means for them. Or you have cone beam technology and you can just say, look, the, the, here's the, the, the most powerful diagnostic tool in existence for dentistry. We have it because we want to offer you the best possible treatment and maybe be able to diagnose everything and treat you as quickly as possible. Because that's what they're looking for too. They're looking for some, how can it be faster? How can it be more comfortable? And never forget, you know, again, we're talking about what do you not want them to feel? You don't want them to feel afraid, unsafe, uncomfortable, inconvenienced. And so you get something like CADCAM technology where you can reduce the visit and reduce these three things, okay? Because people hate shots, they hate drills, and they hate impression materials. These are, a lot of people forget they hate the impression material just as much. It's really unpleasant for people. And so when you're scanning them digitally, one, you got much better information the first time. You can send it straight to a lab. But modern technology, which impresses people, and there's no impression material. It's a positive, unexpected thing. And also, keep in mind that, that from a point of delight or a detail that makes a difference, being more convenient for them in any possible way, in terms of access to you, in terms of answering the questions, in terms of how they can get to the office or communicate with the office, either through the website or messenger or a chat bot. All of these things make a difference in, in terms of how people can take advantage of, of your practice and appreciate it. So. Keep in mind everything from hours to you know how you process their insurance to how you explain stuff uh, to how you get them out of there faster. All of that matters and is is a, an effective detail in creating real value for them. People value if you don't have a notice. People value convenience. I live in a neighborhood where I think fifty percent of the things people buy come from Amazon. I mean, there's, there's more cardboard in this area from the, the deliveries than I've ever imagined possible, but it's because it's convenient. Comes the next day. Another little detail of delight, handwritten notes, thanking them for referring a patient. My, my hygienist sends a handwritten note to every patient every day. She just, uh, she just writes, sits down, and, and, and knocks out, you know, uh, a few notes every day to people, thanking them for coming in. Just reminds them that the practice is thinking about them, that the practice cares about them. And we don't get good mail. We don't get good email. But if you send a nice note like this, it makes a huge difference. And have little gift cards to give away if something goes wrong in the practice. It doesn't have to be much. Maybe you're running really late or something like that. And you just say, look, we're sorry. We're, this, we fell really behind in the schedule. The doctor came in drunk again, you know, and, and uh, so it's thrown everything off. So here's a little Starbucks card. Here's a little Amazon card or an iTunes card or something like that. Uh, you know, just, just to say, we get that your time is valuable or, or we made a little mistake and we're, and we're sorry. Because that's all people like is that you know that they're, you're respecting their time and the value that it has. Or here's a great thing. You get a complex case, offer to pick up the patient. Say, look, you, we don't want you to have to drive. You're going to be uncomfortable. We, we don't want you to have to uh, uh, do anything. And we're, we're going to make sure you get a ride home. Uh, and, and we're going to handle it all through Uber. Uber actually has Uber Health, whole HIPAA compliant thing that it can do, and that you can do, pay for the ride, pick them up, and, and it doesn't violate HIPAA. But it's a wonderful thing to offer. Most people aren't going to take you up on it, but they're all going to remember that you offered. Even something as simple as just stopping in the middle of a procedure and saying, look, your mouth's been through a lot. We're just going to give you a, a quick break here. Let your muscles relax and stuff like that. And we're, we're, we're more than halfway done. Oh, more than halfway done. Oh, that's great. 
So that's, that, these are little things that you can do and little messages that you can give them that says you care about them. Give your patients, I recommend it to dentists all the time, give your patients your cell number. They're not going to call you all the time. And they can always text you. And that's, but they're not going to abuse it. If they abuse it and they leave you as a patient, you block them. But this says, I'm available for you if you need it. And, now, and, and here's an, an important point I, I, about all the stuff that, that happens in, in healthcare in particular, um, but I wanna, I wanna drive this point home, is that if, if you're making an offer, making a promise, fulfill it, okay? Whatever you promise to do, do it. If you're gonna give somebody your cell number, answer it, respond to the text, because there's nothing worse than not fulfilling a promise that you offered. And as it says here, promise unfulfilled is worse than a need unmet. I, I live by that. Now, I use this example of pistachios uh, because I, I want to illustrate a, a certain amount of timing that's important in customer service. It's like sometimes, you know, if I love, I love pistachios. So sometimes I'm eating them and I'll get through a whole stack of them and, and, and I'll get to one and it's one of those rotten, nasty, burned ones. and I'm suddenly looking through all the shells and everything going, well, there's got to be one more. Sometimes that rotten, burnt, nasty pistachio is the last pistachio. And it ruins the whole pound and a half of pistachios for me. This is a metaphor for the service industry because what happens last can affect everything. Either wipe out a positive experience with one negative thing or fix a negative thing with one positive thing. So remember, in, in, in particularly in any service interaction, which is dentistry, what happens first and what happens last matter most. These are the bookends of the experience and what people remember most. So whatever you're doing at the beginning, make sure you're doing it with care, with positivity, with likability, and the same thing with how it ends. And one of the things that you can do, particularly as a revenue well customer, because you have the capacity to text your patients, is don't just send a text, send a video text. If it's their birthday, have the whole team send them a happy birthday text. It takes 10 seconds to record it and send it to the patient. Do a few of those a day or do an evening check-in that's a visual message that says, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Send me a text back if, uh, every, if you're not comfortable. Um, I want to make sure you're okay. Um, or you want to welcome a new patient to the practice. You send them a welcome video by text, just a quick message from you. People watch that stuff when they're on the phone. They love that stuff. And so I want to talk about the, the interesting thing here about human behavior, and it's this thing called the peak intensity study. Now, I'm not going to get into it in detail, but it basically measured um, how people react to negative experiences. And the, the, the exciting and interesting and sort of bizarre result is human beings are not consistent in how they remember negative experiences. They do this thing where they when they're just trying to decide how bad an experience was and they're recalling in the past, they actually take the worst moment, the worst moment in the whole experience and the last moment, and they kind of average the two. But what's fascinating is it doesn't matter how long the worst moment was. It could be a minute, could be 15 minutes. It still gets averaged equally with the last moment. So what that means is, hey, you've got a dental visit. It's going to have some unpleasant duration to it, right? So let's look at typical example. Uh, this is the pathway of the patient, uh, the, the green script, so to speak, if Hitchcock were looking at it, saying what's, what's going on in, in the patient's experience. And so 
if the if the treatment is obviously the low point and the high point is leaving and you and you don't capitalize on that by not doing something like an evening check-in or something like that now that last last moment is or worse they walked out the last thing that's happening is you're arguing about money with them the copay at the front desk or nobody said goodbye to them or, or look forward to seeing you on your next visit you miss that opportunity or you don't do an evening check-in now the last pistachio is a rotten one and it hurts the whole average of the experience. So imagine if you just changed the last moment, focused, made sure you were paying attention to that last moment. It would make all the difference. So think about what happens last. And if it's something that you're doing like, oh, well, well we always do this. We always double check that we've got the money from them before they leave. It's like, no, you got to eliminate that thing, okay? whatever the heck it is, or, or just like you try to wrestle them to the next appointment instead of doing it in a, in a, in a friendly, simple way. Um, or you just try to diminish the negativity of the moment or move it backwards. Get the money at some other time. Get that cleared up before it's the last moment. And diminishing it also means that last moment is their home and they're not feeling good. Anesthesia is wearing off. You talk to them. You text them, you send them a little video text and say, how are you doing? You know, now you're diminishing the negativity of the experience and you're giving them something sweet. You're adding a little frosting there that's making all the difference. What happens last is critical. And I want to, you know, as we talk about the green script, about the emotional experience, I want to point out something that happened when Ritz Carlton was trying to figure out why patients didn't come back. Patients, not, <laughs> I'm, that's all I do is talk about patients. The, when hotel guests didn't return to Ritz Carlton, they, they did a survey and they found out that 67% of the people said it was because of the indifference of a single employee, not the mistakes, not the rudeness, not the bad food, not the dirty room. All it took was indifference from one person. You know why? Because it makes people feel insignificant. Nobody likes that. And think about how quickly you perceive indifference. Over the phone, in person, and that's why what happens first is so important. That's why the front desk is, is, is the aorta of the practice. What happens there, both first and last, on the phone, makes such a difference. This is a, a, a really important position, and it's the most undertrained uh, uh, and often underpaid position, and it shouldn't be. It should be the most attentive for position with the happy person. And, and I try to make this point, too, is, you know, the front desk is really not just that person sitting there. Everyone is actually the front desk. Everyone is in, in charge of that first experience of, of what it's like to be. Think of the word reception. How are you receiving them? How do they feel received in the practice? It's everybody's responsibility because what happens is, and people don't realize this too, 50% of new patients are lost during the first phone call. That's a terrible waste. Why is that happening? Well, because they're feeling indifferent. They're feeling insignificant. Somebody's talking. They're feeling mistrust. They're feeling unsafe. They're feeling uncared for. They're feeling inconvenienced. They, they've, you've, you've created a hit list of things that repel people, and you want to eliminate them one by one. And, of course, the best way to train the front desk is you've got to record them. And there's all sorts of tools out there to do that now. Patient Prism is, is a great one because it actually uses uh, uh, AI to analyze the phone calls and gives you the information back, tells people about it, uh, about the conversation. 
tell, and tells your front desk that you can call this person back that didn't convert to a patient and say, oh, we forget to mention we offer financing or we have a new patient visit offer that I forgot to tell you about. Or you asked about implants and I didn't really explain that we have this fantastic cone beam technology. So when you record the calls and analyze them, you can actually call people back that slipped away and recover them. Patient Prism is finding that they get 20% recovery of people who didn't appoint. I mean, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I don't own Patient Prism. I'm just telling you about it because in, in 30 something years of running 800 dentists, the number one problem was what happened with the patient when we handed it off to the practice. The loss was, is, was epic and tragic. And so I have some key points for the front desk that you can pass on. And one of them, don't diagnose over the phone. This happens all the time. Get them in the office. That's the, the, if they, you're not going to fix anything over the phone. They may have questions. You say that doctor would be very concerned about that. You should come in and see him because until he can really look in your mouth or she can see what's going on and get some x-rays, we don't really know. But it sounds like something the doctor would be very concerned about. So can we get you in today? which means never hang up without offering an appointment. And also don't overscreen the new patient to find out if, if they got money or if they're the right patient for the practice. Sort them out in the office. And finally, very simply, when people, don't let people cancel an appointment casually. Let them off the hook by just, oh, you know, I, I, I got a hair appointment that conflicts with it, so I'm not gonna come in. Now, you, they've reserved the surgical suite. You've got to retrain your patients to think differently about your schedule and not be so casual about it. And I know it's hard. It's one of the biggest challenges. But there's, there's ways to defeat this. Um, but it starts with having that person at the front desk who understands their primary responsibility. Two things. Be happy. Get the patients in. It's, that's the simple job description. And now, of course, because everyone's the front desk and everyone's creating the experience, you need an amazing team. This is, this is my sales team from a couple of years ago at, at uh, Densply Serona World event. And, uh, you know, we, we always had a great corporate culture at 800 Dentists, and it made an enormous difference in how people responded to us, particularly over the phone when we were helping them find a dentist. But you need a strong practice culture. And to have that, don't think of your, your practice like a family of people. Think of them like a team. A sports team is not going to keep people just because they like them. They're going to keep them because they're pulling in the same direction and doing a great job and creating a positive experience with that patient and with all the patients and working together and understanding their position and their importance in creating that patient experience and getting patients to accept treatment for their benefit. So you got to get comfortable sometimes letting people go because they're not because they're, they're not good clinically because they may be fine, but if they're not willing to create the experience and contribute to it and communicate that, and some of that involves working with social media and stuff like that, too, which is another whole discussion. But you want to be able to get this team all thriving, positive, happy. And here's what happens when you create a great culture, because that's the responsibility. And that's a bigger discussion, too. And I talk about that in both my books and my video course is how you create this culture, how you find these people, how you train them, how you help them understand why they're doing what they're doing. That's a lot of what I'm talking about now in, in these the details of delight and adding the frosting is this culture of, is based on knowing why you're doing this. It's so that patients will relax and appreciate the experience in the practice and accept treatment. And when you create a great culture, it attracts more great people. That's the beauty of it is when you've got a great place to work, people want to come work for you and they want to stay. And so it comes down to a really simple word like likability. It's fun. Is your place, this is where you got to go to work every day. 
Why not make it fun? And if, if you're the dentist and you're not fun, get yourself a bunch of fun people all around. They'll bring it out of you. Um, or they'll, you'll wrap so much fun around you that people will think you're fun even if you're not. But, and I don't, it's not a playground, but it's, but when people walk into an office and say, wow, these people really like working here, that has a powerful effect on people. And so what I say is hire, don't just hire people with the right attitude, which is important. I want you to go to the next level. I want you to hire people who are motivated to do a great job and give a great experience. And then you inspire them by what they get to do every day, by this incredible opportunity to work in the dental practice and help people as your career on a daily basis to transform their appearance, to make them healthier, to make them happier in a truly tangible and, in, and enriching way. And, you know, doing this is, is not easy. And, and, you know, I can talk to you about this for an hour, but I always try to bring up this point is like, it's so important to have a good coach. You know, every successful business person and every athlete has at least one coach. Do you think Tiger Woods doesn't have a coach? He's probably got three different coaches. He's got his putting coach and his, his you know, backhand coach and, and, you know, backhand is tennis, I know. Uh, but, but, I mean, that's all athletes have two, three coaches their whole lives. They don't stop because, oh, I'm good enough. No, they want to get better. And anybody in business who wants to get better, I have mentors and coaches that I use all the time because I want to get better and better and better. And the same thing is true in dentistry. You need people who understand, who come from the outside world and say, these are the systems and the behaviors and the tools and the actions that, that can transform your success. And you can always get better and better. And sometimes the coaching is very personal. What you, what you need to change yourself or about yourself. But it's, but you, and you're not always going to, you're not going to be able to figure those things out yourself. And you can't just work in your business fixing teeth all day. You've got to understand a lot more about how to run a successful business. That's what great coaches can do. And I like to bring this point home, which, because this is our most underutilized tool in all business is expressing appreciation to the team members and to the patients. This is, this is a true detail of delight that transforms the culture of the practice and the experience of the practice. It is almost to a ridiculous level expressing appreciation to everybody. I had a, I'll, I'll sum it up in one quick story. A friend of mine uh, who's a office manager, has been an office manager for 22 years uh, and, and moved to a, another office because the dentist finally retired. She said, he thanked me every day for what I did that day. No matter what, he, if I were leaving the office and he was on the phone and he was maybe talking to a specialist about a case, he'd put his hand over the phone and he'd say, hold on for a minute. And he'd turn to me and say, Joanna, thanks for a great day. Really appreciate everything you do here. She said every day. Now, she hadn't worked with a guy for five years. She's never forgotten the difference that made in her work day. You can't express enough appreciation. We all fall short. Uh, Jonathan, I've been talking a blue streak here and a green streak. Um, do we have some questions? Because I also want to mention my video course that's available to them. We do have a few questions. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. I love your... Um recommendation of giving out a cell phone number it reminds me of a restaurant here in chicago where uh the owner of the restaurant on every receipt afterwards he's like here's my personal number if you liked it you didn't like it you need something let me know and i mean i never text him but it's always one of those things where you're like eh, maybe i could um <laughs> you know it's like it's yeah. it. again it's just like the perception of availability um yeah. so yeah we do have a few questions uh we have one here where you discussed um, like kind of like the front of a, a practice, so how just looking uh, differently 
can increase people to uh, their spending habits, and then you then oh, talked yeah. about the, yeah. and then you you then talked about the back of the practice. If somebody has to make a decision where to invest in the front or the back, do you have a recommendation there? Always start with the reception. It's the first impression. Um, but but it, uh, you know, take a. It's always good to take a hard look. Like bring somebody else in. Like if you have a a Patterson rep or or, or your distributor somebody like that, Shine or whatever, or Burkhardt or, or any of these guys, have them come in and say, do a walk around here and tell me what you what jumps out at you as doesn't look clean, doesn't look modern, doesn't feel, doesn't look comfortable or inviting. Um, and be, just say, look, be hypercritical here. I may not do everything, but I want to hear everything you say. And they'll, they can walk around and say, I'm looking at this event and I'm looking at at, um, at this, uh, and it looks dirty, this air conditioning vent that's over, and the patient's lying there looking up at it. Uh, and boy, this, this, there's enough coffee stains in this carpet that you could probably, uh, you know, dye the whole thing and, and, and change the color uh, and, and hide them, or, but maybe the carpet needs to go. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's like, wow, it, it really, you can really smell the wrong things in this practice, you know, and, and fix all of it. Um, and some, most of it's not expensive, but don't be afraid to modernize. Um, I just wanted to, before, before I wanted to mention a couple of things to people. Uh, if they wanted my books, the best place to buy them is at fredjoyle.com. And if you use the discount code Fred Joyle, they're $10 uh, delivered. Don't go to Amazon to buy the hard covers. It's twenty five dollars plus shipping. Um, you do this, um, but they're also available on Audible and on Kindle. Um, and I've taken all of this knowledge that I've accumulated over the years and put into the two books and beyond, and created um, an eight week video course, thirty two videos that you can use with your team to teach them all of this stuff and retrain new employees and get everybody to create that great patient experience. Normally six ninety seven, but for revenue well clients, we're doing a special discount, um, three hundred dollars off of the six ninety seven price. So you almost cuts it in half. Um, and you go to fredjoyle.net for that uh, and use Newdell as in Alex Newdell uh, as the discount coupon code all caps and you'll save three hundred dollars so just wanted to make sure people knew about that because i know people bail a lot of times at the top of the hour um but let's answer some more questions jonathan in the meantime okay i love it and uh let's see here um okay yeah you talked about uh having an engaging team so let's say you inherit a practice how do you audit the members of the team and decide, you know, if they're all long-term members, who to keep, who maybe needs to transition? Uh, I, I think it's, everybody knows who that person in the practice is that's not pulling in the same direction. Um, you know, she's, she's affecting the attitude of everyone. And I, I always mention it this way. It's like, you, you can't make a miserable person happy. Uh, they, you don't have the psychological training or the, the money or the managerial skills to make them a happy person, but they can make your happy people miserable. So that's the first one to go. And then, then it's, then it's people who are not, you know, like a, a friend of mine, he said, I got a great hygienist. She just won't mention any other treatment to the patient. Like, no, that's a terrible hygienist. You know, she's not willing to talk about what's possible or even what the patient needs. She's got a trusted relationship in that patient with that patient. And all she can think about is telling the patient he doesn't have to do this anything right now. That's not even professional. Never mind, you know, doing a good job from a practice growth standpoint. So you it, it's it's. Very much about, and, and you should use software like, like HR for Health has, uh, is a great product that isn't just about when you first hire somebody and, and keeping your practice in compliance. It's about 
performance reviews that you can do on a regular basis that, that you can point out the positive things, point out the negative things. And I also tell people, look, you either have to retrain somebody to make them better. And sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's like courses like mine that says, this is why you do the stuff that you do that makes a difference with the case acceptance. This is why we're trying to create a better patient experience. But very much my books and my video courses about why you do this stuff, why it works on people and why they're not reacting the way you want them to because you're not doing these things. So you want to retrain them or you move them into a different position. Maybe their personality type is such that they're, they, they don't interact with people that well like a front desk person. They're not always happy, but they're, they're great at, at getting the billing and, and insurance filing and all of that stuff. They're super detailed about that stuff, and you can totally count on them to do that. That should be their position. So you move them, and if, and if you can't figure out how to retrain them or, or you, you know, move them to a different position, then you, you gotta replace them. You gotta, you gotta look at the team, look at it just like a professional coach says, look, I, I, I need a better center or I need a better tight end or whatever. You know, I, I, I've got to change the team up to, so, that, so that everybody is, is giving this experience. And it's, it's never easy, um, but it's also necessary because the patients are perceiving the dissonance in the practice as well. Uh, this question kind of piggybacks on this too. So we have an individual who, um, a doctor, they, I don't want to say not personable, but not really, um, you know, they find it difficult to like forge a connection with patients. Do you recommend, they're kind of questioning about like, do you recommend then hiring a team around you who is really gregarious and, and talkative to kind of help bring you out of the shell? Yeah, and it's and it doesn't even have to bring the doctor out of his or her shell. They can be very shy or very you know aloof or any of those things, as long as the rest of the team isn't. Because in the end, the dentist is the the top clinical professional. That's her primary responsibility. The rest of the team can take on the role of creating the great experience. So. Uh, it's, it, you know, the only person you can't replace is the dentist, right? So you have to, you, you wrap a great team around them and, and, the, and the dentist may find themselves being a little bit more social, but they don't have to be, they, they have to be great. And, and again, they may, it's just like having a treatment coordinator. If you're not great as the dentist about talking about the money and stuff like that, don't talk about it. Talk about this is this is what I recommend that you do uh, whenever you're ready to get started. But I want you to sit down with Angela and she'll talk about how how we handle these treatments and how you can pay for it if, if you're interested in doing it. And he gets the heck out of the room and lets Angela take over because this is Angela's skill set. So it's it's the only skill you really need as a dentist is uh, to you know, what you're licensed to do. And actually that's the most efficient way to run a practice is, is the dentist should only be doing from a clinical standpoint, the stuff that's required for him or her to do. And everything else should be delegated to a team member. You know, it, it makes me crazy when I hear these dentists who are doing their own profies. It's like, what's next? You're going to wash the windows. You know, it's like, you know, the, the, you, you should be generating more revenue by what you do and have somebody who's paid less and and it will it'll make their job much more interesting to do the maximum that they're licensed and allowed to do in the practice too um so yeah it's the, you don't have you, you just wrap the best team around you possible but the dentist has to also be honest with herself and say look this isn't me i'm not social i'm not friendly i'm i'm not like that i'm, I'm too shy or i just all i I just like like drilling and filling and 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 diagnosing and stuff like that. Um, fine, don't do it. But understand, be be honest with yourself and say, I still need it, so I need a team that does it. 
Uh, let's see here. And I think we've got one more unless somebody else jumps in. Um, I thought this was actually pretty interesting as well. Um, you talked a little bit about training and then you also had some slides on, on proper phone skills. Do you think like that's area number one in a practice that needs uh, refining considering the amount of opportunity that can come in and the opportunity of, of that could be lost? Yeah. Uh, like I said, the number one problem with eight, that we experienced at 800 Dennis, literally from day one, was what happened when a patient got handed off to that front desk over the phone. The waste was, you know, because they projected indifference or they, they didn't listen to the person or, or they started talking about how you were going to pay for it before they even got the person's name down, you know. Uh, they, they, the, the, the training is so critical and it's not complicated, but it's, you know, it starts with the basics. It's like, don't, don't be trying to diagnose over the phone, have one purpose to get that person in the office. If you've got a terrific patient experience, you want them to see that office, even if you don't take their insurance. You say, look, we, we'll help you process your insurance, but, and, and we're happy to do an exam to let you know what's going on in your mouth. But I think you're really going to love this practice. Oh, my whole family comes here. They would never go anywhere else. Uh, and so we can get you in at 2 o'clock today. You can see our practice. You can, we'll tell you what's going on in your mouth. And you can go anywhere you want after that. You want them to lust after your practice. And, and if, if they go somewhere else that takes their insurance, they're lying in the chair going, why am I here? I'm, I'm only going to save 200 bucks and I'm getting all this work done. Uh, I want to go to that place. Or they may go to the dentist who takes their insurance, but they recommend yours. When people say, oh, I'm looking for a dentist. Well, don't go to mine. Go to this practice, this, this place, SmileWorks. That place is amazing. You know, I wish I could go there. Uh, that's what can happen. So it's it's so much when it, when you think about when to reduce the job to two words, uh, three words, get them in, uh, and and be really pleasant on the phone. But then it's you know the other details you can learn. But you've got to that's finding that person. You don't create that person. There's people that are just happy all the time. Uh, find those people. They don't have to even work in dentistry. You can teach them all the other skills, but you can't teach happy. There's people that wake up with a smile on their face every day and they wear it all day long. Hire them. Where you, you run into it. We used to do that when we hired operators for 800 dentists when we were building the business. Anywhere that my partner Gary and I met some terrific personality, it was like, you want to come work for us? We'll put you on the phone. We'll give you a great job. And that's how we built the team and that's how we built the culture. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I mean, we have people like that here at Revenue Well, too. I was actually just talking with one of them this morning, Michelle Gabrielson, every single time, uplifting. And the, I think I agree with those people are invaluable. Um, well, it looks like that's the end of our questions. I'll pass it off to you for one last uh, plug or anything, Fred, before we sign off. Yeah, well, um, I look forward to meeting some of you out at uh, ADOM or at uh, Dentsply Serona World in October, which is the greatest event of the year. Uh, and uh, don't miss that. Uh, we'll, of course, Alex and I will both be there and uh, lecturing as well. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, if you this video course is a great way to really build your team. And that's and, and it's in short 20 minute videos where you can sit down as a team and watch them or watch them individually and really come away with uh, a, a much better understanding of every aspect of the practice from how to uh, hire the right people, how to create a great culture to a, handling social media effectively and eventually doing your advertising. How do you spend that money properly and track that and all that? It's all in there in the course. So uh, check it out and use the discount code to save some money. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a, a, a great week and a great year. And I look forward to meeting you all someday out there. And uh, thank you, Jonathan. And thanks, Revenue Well, for having me. 
Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And to everybody, thank you for attending. We will be sending a uh, recording of this out to all registrants. So thanks again and have a great day. Bye, everyone.